Let's talk about the adjusted R squared, also written as R bar squared, but nobody says that. That's just how you would write it down. But before we get into that, let's go and talk a little bit more about regular R squared. So take a model like the one that's written down where we're trying to predict Y based on an intercept and five X variables. Of course, the error term, the residual UI hat, is what's not explained by the model. It's the difference between the actual y and the predicted y. Now this model that I have, as long as x3, x4, or x5, or any combination of those variables has some explanatory power over y, then this model with five variables is going to do better than trying to predict y with only the first two x variables. You see, Everything that right now is explained by the beta 3 hat times x3 plus beta 4 hat times x4 plus beta 5 hat times x5, that used to be part of the error term if you only had x1 and x2. So some of that error is being explained away. The sum of squared residuals will fall. The explained sum of squares will increase. The r squared will go up. However, it is possible that you could add just some random numbers as an x variable, and that could, in the case of your sample, look like it has some explanatory power. You could get r squared to go up when you add more variables. You can never get r squared to go down by adding more variables. As you add more variables, r squared will definitely go up. The idea of the adjusted r squared is to make an adjustment that compensates for the addition of more variables. So let's write down the formula for r squared. We have one minus a fraction, so leave a little bit of space there, SSR over TSS. So you could use that to calculate r squared. But if we want to do the adjusted r squared, we're going to multiply that second term by an adjustment factor. So the adjustment factor is n minus one divided by n minus k minus one. Now you'll notice that that fraction is always larger than one. So the adjusted r squared will always be smaller than the regular r squared. Also, you could rewrite the adjusted r squared formula as one minus s squared u hat, right? That's the sample variance of the residual divided by s squared y, which is the sample variance of your y variable. I'm going to show you three things to note about the adjusted r squared. So first of all, as I mentioned above, because that adjustment factor of n minus 1 divided by n minus k minus 1 is greater than 1, we're always subtracting a bigger value from the adjusted r squared than we are from the regular r squared. And that means the adjusted r squared is always less than r squared. Second, adding a regressor has two opposite effects on the adjusted r squared. So on one hand, the sum of squared residuals falls, and that would tend to increase the adjusted r squared. But on the other hand, when you add another variable, that means that k is increasing. When k increases, that is going to decrease the size of the denominator in the adjustment factor, which makes that whole second term larger. So we're subtracting a larger number that would tend to bring the adjusted r squared down. Now you see these two effects are fighting against each other. And how do you determine which one wins? Well, basically, if the variable that you're adding has more explanatory power than this penalty for adding another variable, then you'll see an increase in the adjusted r squared. But if you just add a junk variable without much explanatory power, then the adjusted r squared will fall. The final thing to note is that it's possible for the adjusted r squared to be negative. So that would only happen if you have a really terrible model. First of all, your regressors are not explaining very much of the model, so the sum of squared residuals is really close to the total sum of squares, right? That means the explained sum of squares is really small. 
And then when you multiply that SSR over TSS by the adjustment factor, you could get a number bigger than one, which could drive the adjusted R squared negative. Remember that the regular R squared has to be between zero and one, and the adjusted R squared is smaller than the regular R squared. Let's talk about using and interpreting both R squared and adjusted R squared. So what do they tell you? What don't they tell you? You don't want to rely too heavily on these measures. When they go up, that's showing you that your current model is doing a better job of fitting the data in your sample. But remember, like I said before, you could just add some random numbers and it happens to increase your R squared, potentially even increasing your adjusted R squared. But that would not give you better predictions on out of sample observations. The R squared and adjusted R squared tell you whether the regressors are good at predicting or explaining the values of Y in your current sample of data. R squared and adjusted R squared do not tell you if an included variable is statistically significant. If you want to find out if a variable is statistically significant, you would just do a t-test. Next up, they do not tell you if the regressors are a true cause of the dependent variable. Remember that correlation is necessary for one variable to cause another, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough. We need a mechanism. So for example, we've been talking about test scores in the textbook. Imagine that you ran a regression with test scores as your Y variable and parking lot area per pupil as your X variable. Well, the parking lot area is correlated with the student teacher ratio and also with whether the schools in a city or a suburb might even be correlated with district income. And those things are correlated with test scores. So it might look like parking lot size per student has an effect on test scores. But imagine going to the school board and saying, hey, I know how we can raise test scores this year. Let's just make our parking lots bigger. Right? That's kind of silly. So be careful. R squared is not going to tell us if these things are causal. The next thing that the R squared and adjusted R squared cannot tell you is if you have omitted variable bias. It turns out that omitted variable bias can occur in regressions with either a really high or a really low R squared or adjusted R squared. So we will talk more about omitted variable bias in another lesson. And finally, R squared and adjusted R squared will not tell you if you've chosen the most appropriate set of regressors. So having a high R squared doesn't mean that you've chosen the best variables and having a low R squared doesn't mean that you've chosen the worst variables. When you're deciding on which regressors to include in your model, you should rely on economic theory. Is there a reason that you think this X variable should influence the Y variable? You also need to think about omitted variable bias. Right? What are you leaving out? Is there something that you don't have data on that's correlated with one of your X variables? Again, we'll talk more about that later. And I just said something about data availability. Do you have access to these other variables? Sometimes you might include a suboptimal variable because you can't get the better variable. And finally, you might want to look at data quality. If the numbers are not recorded properly, they might not be so great to include in your model, even if that same variable, if captured properly, would be good to include.